What's happening, everybody? We are back with episode eight of the Spot Burn podcast. Today, it's just your two hosts. You got Dan and... Bam, bam. Just the two of us. Uh, but yeah, it's the hard efficient season here in the Midwest, so we... Uh, we uh we had to get ourselves together to get another episode recorded because the muskies are calling, um, or ignoring, depending on how you look at it. But uh it's it's kind of one of the best times of the year. We talked about it on an earlier episode, and like it's kind of funny that we're here now. Whatever you want to do, people come in the shop and they're like, What's what should I fish for? And it's just whatever muskies, smallmouth are biting on top. There's hatches almost daily for trout. Harper, but like it's just whatever. Pick your poison. Pick your poison, which is maybe a good theme for today, because um, we got a fun one. We're gonna get into boats, 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 boats. We get a lot of questions about what type of boat should I get. I want that boat. I'm gonna use this boat. What, what do you like this versus that? And uh, we're gonna kind of just go through the whole gamut of things. Spot burn boats. Um, we're gonna try and cover as much as possible. What? we think about with boats what are some decisions you should think about good choices bad choices pros cons you name it we're going to try and talk about it all but first let's thank our sponsors podcast is sponsored by two awesome companies we got Cortland line company american made fly line most durable stuff out there big fans of it here at musky fool we also have stealth craft boats from baldwin michigan makers of custom river boats from hooligan rafts the stealth weld and everything in between. They got a whole batch of things and very cool about them. Unlike a lot of other boat manufacturers out there, they are custom. They're going to make it to your specs, tweak things, add a bigger deck, extra seats, less seats, you name it. They can probably put it in there. And if they haven't done it, I'm sure they would love to start chewing on it. You give them something, something juicy, something new that they haven't done before, but go check them both out. Go give them some love, some support. We really appreciate y'all supporting this podcast. Next up, we got the current events and happenings in musky country. Feels like a while since we sat down and recorded. I haven't really even talked to you in a few days, Bam. Uh, Catch me up. You guys had a pretty fun northern opener um, up at the Chippewa River Lodge. Is there a name for that place, by the way? Is 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 there a new name for that? Old Bogey's Old Lodge? Old Bogey's New Lodge? Yeah, we just call it bogeys. Tom's bogeys. bogeys. But that is Love a, it. There we go. The, the formal headquarters of Chippewa River Custom Rods up in Holcomb, Wisconsin. So that's what we used for home base this year for our opening Northern Muskie Camp in Wisconsin. It was a lot of fun. Kind of tough fishing, but we had a blast regardless. That's good. Yeah, it's it's really sweet what he's done with that place. Um, and for those that you know want a little bit more details. Uh, it used to be an old bar on the banks of the Chippewa River. He's kind of retrofitted the bar into the sweetest rod shop in Wisconsin. He's renovated the whole garage into like a beautiful, beautiful apartment. Um, if you want to taste, you can uh, give us a shout. We uh, we're we're booking. A, we got a couple trips on the books already this year, where folks will be staying and kind of headquartering, home basing out of Bogey's retreat. Uh, and it's bound to be a good time. Tom is like the world's best host in the entire, like the best. He just goes over the top every time. It's like he does with his rods. You also caught a tiger muskie the other day. That's pretty sweet. That's, uh, that's like, that's a pretty rare sighting in Wisconsin, especially Northern Wisconsin. Yes, sir. That was, uh, those are unicorn amongst unicorns. Super fun when they come in the net. Think you got a pike on and then you realize a super rare um uh, musky that was the third one i've ever caught and it was just over 36 inches and it happened to be during uh, our musky league that we're doing this summer so it was super fun to see that nice specimen just a flawless body no scrapes or anything like that too it was a fun fish and that was a, a native and wild tiger musky correct that was not a stock yes tiger sir musky. Yeah, Northern Wisconsin, yep. pretty much all native. That's sweet. That is pretty sweet. Uh, and it sounds like was, there about- was anything notable on that. Did it kind of just swam into the net is what it sounded like. Your your net man was just in the right place at the right time. He sure was. Yeah, we were rowing upriver <laughs> to get to the spot. 
kind of fishing along the way and, and we both hopped out and it was the second cast into a big whitewater rapid section and, and he smoked it in the middle of the craziest part of the rapids basically set the hook on himself and he swam right over to jake and jake in a perfect spot to net him it couldn't have gone any smoother uh, and jake had the net that's good those are they are you mentioned it though yeah. it's like they're kind of they're a weird emotion because you're like oh musky ah oh, pike oh tiger musky you go from like high low super high all in like five seconds usually at least when you get oh, a tiger yeah. musky on I've only caught two yep. so i have whole 33 percent less experience with them than you <laughs> your day's coming again dan how about uh -huh. you you've been getting out what are you up to? These I've been days? getting out. I've been getting out. I've been staying a little quiet about it because uh, we have the PMTT this weekend. When this podcast records, it'll be in the past. So you'll be able to see how that goes. And uh, I've just been focused on the Madison chain. Got the new boat. Um, just been putting in the time, fluffing all the muskies up so they're ready to just devour all of our flies coming this Saturday, June 10th. So we'll see. We're going to be the only fly only team there are about 95 teams going to be fishing will be some monona and kaganza um first place prize is twenty five thousand dollars. so we are gonna you know we're Holy gonna go cow. to the casino and just put some quarters in the slot machine see if muskies come out the other side it's all you can ask for you know we know where they live they just need to put the hooks in their face well um, yeah, on behalf to, of every check it out on behalf of every fly angler on the planet, we're rooting for you guys up against all the gear dudes this weekend, Dano. I appreciate it. It's me and Mr. Gabe Park. I'm uh I'm not I'm 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 in a good spot about it. Just we're not gonna embarrass ourselves. There's there's no risk of that. You'll there'll be a lot of skunk teams. And if we can put a fish or two in the boat with a fly rod, I think that'd be pretty sweet on a pretty hard fishery. Um conditions are looking Good. We were touch and go for a second there as things started to warm up a lot, but um, we have a little cold front rolling in. Should keep temperatures below like 77, probably low to mid to maybe creep up to upper 70s later in the day. So we shall see what happens. I do like tournaments though, even though they're tough. Musky tournaments are fun because you just you just get this like huge amount of data all at once. Like same same place. Same time, 95, you know, 150-odd anglers. You know, someone's going to get them. Always is. Someone, there will not be no muskies caught. So what is going to happen? What's it going to take? Where are they going to be? What are they biting? When's the window? Because that's always cool. You'll see the windows emerge, like, pretty pretty extensively. And then there'll always be some, like, randoms that, like, everybody caught fish at 10 and everybody caught fish at 2. And then there was one random fish caught at... 12 30 and you're like what the what the hell is that fish doing not following the rules so yeah that's what we got going on you'll have to uh, all the results will be posted there'll be some facebook live so by the time this uh podcast airs you'll be able to go on pmtt professional musky tournament trails facebook page and uh and check it out good luck to everybody in the tournament and hopefully you uh you enjoy the madison fishery it's back it's been here a few times and it's back what else we got before we get into it? Um, blah, 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 blah. Guide trips. Um, it's already rolling, folks. It's already rolling, and the muskies are playing ball. Uh, big shout out to Nick's first trip of the year. This does not always happen, but first trip of the year, first time in the boat for the year, client caught a 44 incher, uh, which is pretty sweet. Pretty sweet. Been seeing a lot of them. Folks have been uh, having a lot of good chances. We've had a lot of cool people in the boat, and it's only going to continue. So. Give us a shout if you want to get in on the madness. All right, let's get into the the meat and potatoes. We are talking about boats today. We are talking about boats. We're going to try and cover, as we said, all the categories, what we consider, what we look for, what we like, what we don't like. Um, it's, of course, going to kind of be geared towards fly fishing. You know, boats we like for fly fishing. For muskies, but also for kind of all the things we do here in the upper Midwest. Um, we got a lot 
we got a lot to hit on. We also got a lot of good audience questions. Folks that have been tuning in uh, reached out on Instagram, which was really sweet. So we're going to try and touch on and answer all of those. Um, but generally, I guess as we let's just like slip and slide right into it. What we're we're going to kind of take the approach. We get a lot of questions about basically the one they all kind of triangulate around is like, what boat should I get? I'm looking to get a boat. What should I get? And that's that's the angle we're going to kind of take because there's a lot of options. We do a lot of different stuff here in in the upper Midwest in Wisconsin. That's kind of as we've talked about on previous podcasts why we love it so much here because there isn't just one beat that we all have our same boat and we all do the same thing. It's it's really dealer's choice. You can kind of design the fishing experience you want based on how you want to do it, what you want to chase. Um, so that's how we're going to get into it. Any like ways to kick us off, Josh? Like maybe like just general themes or questions that people should kind of consider before we start going boat by boat that you would, you would want to touch on? Yeah, I would say at the the high level of everything, uh, forget about budget just for a second here. There's three main questions you want to ask yourself when you're, you're going to be buying a boat or looking at new boats or used boats. Where do I mostly fish? Who do I fish with most of the time? And what species yep. am I targeting most of the time? And so you, you really narrow that down because that automatically is probably going to skim a lot of options off the field for you and kind of hone in and give you a good direction of, of what you should start to look into and whatnot. So yeah, let's say, let's say you mostly fish rivers and you mostly fish Esox, so pike or mostly musky probably and we'll say you fish with yourself or one other guy yep then you're gonna want right. to yep go ahead keep going so go now ahead. yeah now you have a pretty good, good direction of okay i'm gonna need a river boat it's gonna have to have a, a decent amount of space for me to work with uh we're gonna have a lot of gear because we're chasing a big fish, which requires a big net, usually a big tackle box, um, long time on the water. So you're going to need space for a cooler and, and all that good stuff. And then if you got one other guy with you, he's going to bring stuff or she's going to bring stuff and you're just going to need a lot more room for all of that. Yep. And what I think those questions on earth and what we'll, we'll definitely unearth in this as we go through these is like two things. There is, at least that I think about, there is no one perfect boat that does everything. But there are a, a perfect boat or close to a perfect boat for individual situations and waters. You know, like what you're kind of getting at there. If you're fishing with two to three people on a small river with no boat landings, yeah, like a, a raft is probably a pretty perfect boat for that. Um, and, and like, you know, you can kind of experiment with those. So it's also like, really, I think that question of like, where do you fish? Where do you want to fish? Whether it's your local hole, your local river, your local lake, somewhere new, you want to, you want to get out of your comfort zone and go explore new stuff. You know, that's, that's kind of the theme, um, for sure. And we're also going to get into like, just individually, I think maybe we each of us haven't been in every type of boat we're going to talk about, but I think together we've pretty much been in most, if not all of the ones we're going to talk about. So, you know, unlike other podcasts where we might be talking completely out of our asses, we'll be only be partially talking out of our asses today. So you'll get a, <laughs> you'll get a very, very educated take. I guess let's start. Uh, um, we'll start. We're, we're going to go small to big, uh, just, just in order of like to make it make a little bit of sense. So, kind of like the canoe kayak realm um you know you're i guess you know pros and cons are usually a good spot to start and it these are really great boats on the budget um for all different reasons they're usually the least expensive to buy uh least expensive to maintain least expensive to transport um you know so they they definitely offer some interesting things especially for folks looking like fish with one or two people by themselves or with another buddy um i don't know have you ever owned did you did you kind of start with the kayak canoe when you started getting your first boats or have you just kind of um been in them occasionally 
Yep. I had a 16 foot Alumacraft canoe way back in the day or aluminum canoe. And that was the first rig that I had. Um, and like you're saying, Dan, there's something to be said about the simplicity of these boats as well, especially when you, you leave all the technology off them. So you're not bringing fish finders or you're not bringing, uh, trolling motors, especially because now that adds the element of you got to get them registered and keep up to date with all of that. And you got to make sure that your motor is running. And so the simplicity is, is amazing in those smaller vessels, but that's not to say you can't outfit them with all this, these cool gadgets. People are putting all sorts of crazy stuff on, on the boats, like dual screens, side imaging, mm -hmm. um, even spot lock trolling motors now are available to be used with uh, canoes and, and kayaks as well. So it's, it it's like pretty the kayaks cool. Especially. Yeah. The kayaks, especially, yeah. it feels like you can, I mean, you can spend thousands of dollars outfitting a kayak. There's kayak yep. tournaments. Um, I think when we dig into the realm of fly fishing, there's a couple that are better. Um, but I think there are some drawbacks, you know, you still have, well, the other thing that I guess is worth mentioning that you have with them is you can get into spots too, like beyond this, the simplicity of you can't pack all this gear and you don't have all this stuff to worry about and registration and, you know, they're pretty easy to figure out how to maneuver in certain bodies of water. They do fine in rivers and lakes and can run in skinny little ponds. Like they can get into a lot of spots probably even more so than most of the other boats we're going to talk about. In fact, definitely more so. You can portage them really easily. They're light. Um, so there, there are a lot of good reasons for them. It's a great spot to start, especially if you're on a budget. You just want something to get you from point A to point B. You know, if it's just like a transport device versus something you're going to actually fish out of. Um, I think that's where the, the drawbacks, for me at least, start to enter the equation is the actually fishing out of them um fly yep. fishing out of them um you're usually going to be sitting down there's some there's some we can talk about it there's like the new canoes some of the jacksons um that old town that like they do offer a little bit more stability not necessarily for someone like me who's six five and completely unbalanced but um they there are people and there's like the new canoes i think they even make like a lean bar attachment that's pretty sweet you'll see guys running those like down on the saltwater flats. You can get your, um, your kind of float pods on your, your stabilizers on your canoe and make them a little, you know, less tippy. Um, but generally, yep. you know, you're in that thing standing up for 10 hours and it's, it's, it's difficult to say the least. I don't know what you think on that one. Yeah. I haven't done a tremendous amount of fishing out of canoes, um, I've done a lot more out of kayaks and I will say that one thing you definitely want to stay away from is a sit inside kayak, especially if you're, you're stripping streamers, it's dang near impossible to do that. So you're going to be looking at a kayak that's definitely has the sit on top capabilities and you for want sure. something that's specifically made for fishing. So it's going to have a wider base. It's going to be a lot more stable and you can actually stand up. Once you got your seed legs and your river hips under underneath you, you can start to get comfortable making casts and, and everything like that. But um, yeah, even sitting down on a sit on top, it's still going to be difficult with stripping streamers, especially big streamers like musky flies all day long. And if you need to get in a good spot for a, a hook set or a strip set, that, that could be tough in, even in a sit on top kayak. It definitely is tough. I mean, it's, just having spent time fishing out of them, I think it it just like creates so many different things that get in the way of purely focusing on fishing effectively. I and in some ways that is what prevents me from having one anymore. And then it also is why I have like a lot of I give a lot of credit to the guys and gals out there fishing out of them in tournaments, fishing fly fishing out of them, musky fishing out of them. Like they have significantly more patience than i possess like undoubt <laughs> undoubtedly um because mm -hmm. i can last like 30 minutes and i'm just like this isn't going to happen 
fish could literally be jumping in the boat and i'm just like this isn't going to happen i my fly line stuck my fly line is in the <laughs> water i'm almost fell in i lost my fly box where's my phone oh my god everything's lost you know it's just like it becomes a little bit of a mental hurdle for me yep but you're right you and then you can you got to kind of make a decision on that not to go too overboard but you got to you start to have this decision of like you get a canoe you get a kayak you know and you you want to be able to fish out of it which is then like you have to make the decision of like well am i gonna paddle it because i can't really paddle well and fly cast at the same time so then you start thinking about motors and stabilizers and you just start creeping up where now you have that super light canoe that you could just put on your roof or your truck bed and now you got to have your outriggers and you got to have your Commote your battery for your trolling motor if you and you just start to add expense and what that does is it kind of reduces that like the beauty and the simplicity of them you know that trolling motor can break it's the battery can go out the you just and the expense goes up so you kind of start to creep into that like next category of like well man i'm spending you know on a good stand up sit on top kayak with all the accessories that allow me to really fish and not think about all the bullshit i'm spending a few grand and then you kind of enter the next category right right around that price point is like rafts um which is like again pretty simple you have some different pieces of the puzzle there but like i think that's something to consider on the maybe the one question we didn't talk about at the beginning was like the budget you know because yep. then you start to have that like, oh, well, I'm spending my really going to spend three, four thousand dollars on a fitted out Jackson that, yeah, I can do all the stuff. But for that price, I could probably find myself a used Flycraft or used NRS or, you know, something um, that offers me something else. And that's we're going to c- keep coming back to it. But that's where we kind of come back to where do I fish? Who do I fish with? What do I target? Because if you're like, screw it, I don't ever want to fish with anybody ever again. You don't want a raft, not necessarily. Um, You might kayak might be perfect. You like going to little secret ponds. It's usually when you're, it's not windy and you can kind of just sit there and there's, so there are, there are very good reasons for one for kind of not to overkill the topic, but I think we laid out several of them as well as the cons. So, and did we miss anything there, Josh? You want to add anything on the kayak canoe? Well, I mean, we didn't talk about, uh, float tubes and stand up paddle boards, which I guess kind of briefly, if you have two kind cents of fall on in that, that category, they, yeah, they kind of fall in that category. It seems like uh, our friends across the pond of the, the pike fishing out belly boats. So they do. All the Europeans. Yep. All those U- European cats, they're chasing the Sir Pike, like Nicholas Bauer. <laughs> they're chasing yeah. those big old, pike out of belly boats and it looks like a it looks like a blast i i've uh, done a lot of fishing out of belly boats like for bass and crappies and i will say sometimes you'll even get a fish of that size that'll pull you around so i can't imagine hooking into some big muskies so again if you're an introvert you want some solitude or maybe you just want something you can get in and out of the water quickly um, and not have to rely on a buddy's schedule that could be a great boat for you um, so yeah, those the are the most portable, there. the most affordable probably is a belly boat. Like literally it's the easiest to transport. So couple that's con- a pro as well. Couple cons, smaller boats in general is you're just limited on space. And so you really have to have your program dialed in. You got to know what you're bringing. You can't over bring stuff and, and yep. whatnot, but it, it, it keeps you, you know, it keeps you clean and precise and you don't need all that extra crap sometimes. Yeah. You just need, you know, a few essential flies, terminal tackle and net. Um, you know, another drawback kind of comparing float tubes to canoes and kayaks is just your ability to cover water. Um, you know, a canoe and a kayak is so much more efficient. So, I mean, arguably you could say more efficient. If we were going to race a canoe and a kayak versus a raft, or a drift boat, a canoe and kayak would win every day of the week, pretty much. So, um, you know, when you compare those to float tubes, like you're not, you're not going very far in a float tube. Um, 
you can get it just about anywhere, literally anywhere, but you're not going very far once it's in the water. <laughs> Unless it's windy, and then you're going to nope. get blown across the lake. <laughs> <laughs> then you're, you're going to go really far. <laughs> you're going to go too far. Too far. I want to go home. <laughs> uh, paddle boards, I, I don't know. Your belly butt. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Paddle boards, I, I mean, kind of similar new kayak you just again as josh was saying you reduce even more so the amount of storage stability is kind of a, a wash they're actually pretty stable um you, you don't want to maybe the one big difference is like i don't really see how paddle boards have any use in current um for a fishing device it, it just becomes borderline dangerous but also just like kind of inefficient like tough tough to maneuver you're 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 gonna get yourself into some weird spots where you're probably not not feeling like you're doing a lot of very effective fishing um <laughs> i don't know maybe someone will prove me wrong someone will respond and they'll show us a video hooking into a 45 inch pike or muskie on a huge swift river and a paddleboard and i'll i'll eat my words i'll eat my words happily um, all right, let's get into the next category, kind of the row boat category. The float boats, as some people refer to them. That's a beautiful float boat you got. I think I've heard that at the gas station before. Where do you take that float boat? Uh, drift boats and rafts. We'll start with rafts. Um, so we're talking here about inflatables, uh, you know, anywhere from your kind of one and a half, two man. Um, to like the three, three plus, you know, whether that's the Stealthcraft Hooligan, uh, Flycraft, NRS, Saturn makes some rafts. Uh, what's the other one I'm missing that's close to the Stealthcraft? It's called uh, Smithfly. Smithfly. Smith yep. Uh, yep. What's the other one too that like uh, it's a little bit older? Uh, it's River Rat. on me. River Rat, that's the newer one. You got the Water Masters. We'll kind of touch on these. But I miss, there's like a, a one, for, it's like called the Mayfly, I think. Dave something. I'm totally blanking. Um, but anyway, all of these are inflatable. You got to pump them up full of air. Um, here in the Midwest, we don't, you'll see a lot of these, especially lately. But uh, I think for the most part, we're going to talk about the ones with a little bit smaller pontoons or uh, kind of the inflatable sections. We're not running a ton of class three, class four, barely any, you know, of the fours and fives. So we can kind of have um, a boat that's a raft, but a little bit more designed for fishing rather than like whitewater rafting. We're not kind of talking about white rotter rafts. Probably would still work. Um, but that kind of is gets into like you might as well get a drift boat territory. So without going too far, we're just talking about like some of those more those fishing rafts, I guess you could call it fishing inflatable rafts. Um, so I guess we'll start talking about size first of all, because there's that's I think the probably the biggest difference among them. I mean, just so we're laying it out, you have on the small side, you got like the water master. I think the Kodiak, uh, they have like a, I think like a two person and maybe even a three person. You got the Flycraft, and then you got some of the bigger options like um, the NRS, the Drifter, which I don't know if they make that anymore. Stealthcraft Hooligan comes in a couple different sizes, and the Smithfly. Um, I've been in a Flycraft, a Smithfly, and a, own a Hooligan. And I know you used to used to have a Flycraft, right, Josh? Correct. Yep. And currently have a hooligan. So we'll, we'll get into this one. I think this is a popular one. Um, just to kind of come out and say it, this is definitely one to consider, um, for uh, going back to those questions that Josh posited, like, where do I mostly fish if rivers and creeks and places without boat landings and small ponds, and you want to fish effectively, you know, you you're fishing with at least another person targeting smallmouth bass, carp, musky, even trout. Like this is, I think, one that we kind of put a star next to. There's a reason Josh and I probably both own one, and we see a lot of them here in the upper Midwest. Um, so let's talk about it. I think, how would you compare them, just to like get it out of the way, how would you compare them? Like why do you want a raft instead of a canoe or kayak? 
And then maybe why do you want a raft instead of a drift boat? Cool. Well, what do you think? I definitely like the thought of spending the most time on this realm of because I think it's in within most people's budgets for sure. Uh, so I'm yep. glad we're here right now. Um, the raft is it's pretty fun because the learning curve for rowing is a lot easier than a drift boat. It's going to be more responsive. It's lighter weight. Um, you're going to have more storage right out of the gates than you will with a kayak or a canoe. It's going to be a lot more stable. Those things are very, very difficult to flip unless you go sideways through a rapid set or get hung up on a boulder or something like that. And even still, they're very difficult to, to flip. They're very yep. rugged. Most of them are self-bailing. So like, yep, you're right. Yep. Most of them are self-bailing. They're super rugged for how lightweight they are. Most companies now are, are doing like a, a triple ply PVC on the bottom and then single ply for the majority of the chambers, except where like the raft frame is on those chambers, then they, they double or triple that up. So it can yep. take a lot of wear and abuse. Um, you can put rod racks on them. So even like one piece fly rods are no problem on those rafts as well. Another cool feature is a lot of them have motor mounts. So you can put it up to like a, a three and a half, four horse. I think the hooligan double XL can even handle a six horse power engine, which is yep. pretty insane. Yep. So and kind of rowdy of, to motor motor these boats. They're like kind of fun to motor. <laughs> it, it gets it gets kind of crazy because there's no track. They really are. Them. They're just purely purely just a glide across the water with a very powerful motor, four horse on them. Yeah. And if you're fishing a a section of river that has some really slow moving water, or maybe you have a deadline, like your significant other says you need to be back for, you can motor out of there, no problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i do love that feature it, yeah and they still kind of have really good portability i mean the reason i got one was like it was just getting exhausting dragging drift boats and putting them in spots that were not full landings um and then it just becomes big for a lot of our like small to medium-sized rivers that are like too big to really wade and there's not great access but too small consistently get drift boats in or you don't have access like it's kind of the perfect medium you know i have a trailer on mine i know you do too which is very nice to have because you can kind of store it easily and get it on and off easily but you can put them in the back of your truck you, i know guys that put fly crafts on the top of their trucks guys and gals that do it so like still have some of that good portability that kayaks and canoes offer which i think is important to a lot of folks being able to get it around Yep. Um, and you can cover, you can cover a lot of water in those boats as well. And in a pinch, they can work on smaller lakes or a calm day lake, you know? Yeah. Not well, a that's, wind. yeah. I think a good point there, like we'll, when we'll circle back on this because there's, it goes to that point we made earlier, which is there's no one do it all perfect boat. And then there are really good, perfect, maybe boats for certain waters. But I think Mm -hmm. rafts kind of do meet a lot of that like versatility criteria which which is which is important especially if you only got room for one boat in your garage um you li only like rivers or small ponds and lakes and rivers you know you only have budget for one boat pretty affordable i mean a brand new xxl hooligan which is probably the most expensive like the biggest biggest hooligan with a trailer you know you're you're able to get that for less than a drift boat brand new i mean for sure under 10 grand um you know i used like a fly craft I, i'd have to probably look it up maybe should have done some more homework here but brand new i don't even think they're they're like probably around four or five nowadays um yeah so like still a good chunk of change but like you're getting a pretty awesome fishing vessel for that you know does a lot of different things um and you can like there, like you said, people, you can kind of, you can kind of do similar, like you can put motors on it. I know someone that's put a helix, you know, 
uh, transducer on one and has a screen. Like you can, you can get carried away. A lot of things to mount on them and storage. We, we camped in, we took six guys or five guys down the river for three days and camped out of two days and camped out of, uh, all our camping gear, camera gear. So like they ride pretty skinny and they can cover, have a lot of, uh, pack a lot of gear in them. So lots of pluses, lots of, lots of pluses. Um, what about cons? haven't owned one or just comparing it to others where where's your head at on some of those to rafts and and you can be specific too, well, like yeah, there's uh, cons different cons for different rafts yeah oh one other point about the pros before i move to the cons sorry i please, just thought of please this. yes so the biggest pro that i found uh in the last couple of years with rafts is um, when mother nature throws you a curveball and you have no flow in any of your rivers. Now, if you own a drift boat, you're totally screwed. So you got to start going to bigger bodies of water, bigger rivers or areas that just have deeper sections where mm -hmm. a raft can virtually hit everything. So in that regard, it's been awesome to have like the last several years when we haven't had good flows. That's a All good right. point. Like, well, and just to elaborate, it's not necessarily as ideal to portage as like a canoe or a kayak, but you can drag it over just about anything pretty easily. Like you get in some really shallow gravel oh, yeah. and you can get out and the thing basically touches the surface with no weight in it and you can pull it over anything. We had to do that with keys. Um, drift boats kind of suck when you have to do that. They can, they can get stuck. Yep. Yeah. That's a good one. Um, now back, back. Back, Back to, to the cons. cons here, Dan. Yep. Uh, I'd say that some of the cons I've observed with rafts are if you're fishing with older folks, they don't feel as secure because the bottom is going to be inflatable for the most part. So it's essentially like an inflatable stand-up paddle board for the floor. It You can put a lot of air in that, and it, it is fairly rigid but it's it's definitely not as rigid as a drift boat or a john boat or a row boat or anything like that so keep that in mind if you you know you fish a lot I've with grandpa dan's falling out of one i think it's on youtube uh <laughs> if you're fishing yeah you're fishing with some older folks or fishing with somebody with uh knee problems hip problems they might not see it as as enjoyable as a hard bottom boat um they can be Especially a little like bit the trickier smaller to ones. get in and out like of the fly crafts. The fly crafts, yep. have, I think, comparing the models, like the hooligans and the Smith flies, are a little bit more stable and sturdy than the fly crafts. The trade off is you can move a fly craft by yourself, and like a hooligan and Smith fly become a little bit of a, you know, you're burning some calories to move those over dry land by yourself. Um, so, you, you know, lightweight Absolutely. and stability kind of are on opposite ends of the spectrum with the rafts. Yeah, that's a good point. Yep. What about the, like I, I that's, keep going, keep going. Oh no, go for it, Dan. Well, I was just going to talk about maintenance. That's the one that I've like come to not enjoy as much as a drift boat, and even like a kayak or canoe. Is there's just there's not really any maintenance. Yeah, if you run your kayak into something and it breaks, of course, if you you know grind your canoe over gravel for a while you're going to have to do some repair and similar drift boats but for the most part like you can kind of just rinse them off put them away wet use them again and i think to really keep your raft working um keep its longevity i'm washing it out and taking the floor out and putting on uv protectant like fairly often I would say probably every third trip at the least, you know, in terms of how, if it, if we're getting in and out of the boat a lot and there's sand and gravel and crap in it, like I'm probably doing that after each of those trips or so something to consider on that. It's not, not perfect in that regard. And then you're patching them and you're going to have some leaks. You know, you don't really have a lot of that day to day issue with something that's a little harder, like a canoe or a drift boat. Yeah. And I think a lot of these rafts are pretty much rated for 
10 to 15 years on the, the long end for a shelf life. If you were to buy one brand new and a loan come with at least like a three, if not a five year warranty from the manufacturer. But uh, yep. if you neglect them, like Dan's saying, leave them out in the sun, uh, typically taking them in more rugged spots. So they're going to get beat up a lot more. So if you don't take care of them, they might not have as long of a shelf life as a, as a hard boat either. Yep. Put your 303 protectant on it that and, and definitely definitely clean them um yeah what else what else well they need to be pumped up i mean that's like yep something you got to do if, if it doesn't have leaks you don't do it a ton i mean i think for someone that's never been in one or owned one you can go for sure a full day for sure a full weekend you know a pretty long while without like having to pump it it's gonna slowly Take a little bit more effort to 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 oar and, and row and get to but like it you're not pumping it up every couple hours, so that's worth noting. But it does require air to make it float. Correct, um, Dano. What about their temperature what about fishing out of them? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Elaborate. Yeah, the temperature will will affect the, the pressure with inside those chambers. So if you fished, you know, you had it perfectly filled up and you're on a guy's weekend or a gal's weekend or whatever, and you go to bed that night, it gets super cold. Next morning, you get up, that thing's going to be pretty deflated. But then as the sun comes out, it will eventually stiffen up a little bit more. So, yeah, it's just kind of like that fine dance of keeping it inflated. Maybe you get a little mm -hmm. bit of sand in the valve and you get a slow leak and, and not too. So, yeah, always being cognizant of that. Yeah. Um, I think let's talk maybe a little bit like the pros and cons just of them rowing and fishing out of them because I think that was also an adjustment for me when I went from a drift boat to a raft. And I think the first point I'd make there, which we'll, we'll cross into this, like that versatility question, uh, having a drift boat and a raft at the same time, I ultimately did get rid of my drift boat and sold it because – those hooligans, Smith flies, some of the bigger rafts. Um, yeah, drift boats like better to row, especially in wind and bigger water. It's more comfy to fish out of, but there's a lot of crossover. I mean, there are very, very similar boats. They're going to get you in similar spots. You obviously will get in skinnier water with less manicured boat landings with the rafts, but you know, genuinely rowing down a pretty decent sized river, there there's a lot of crossover there. So you probably unless you're just a pure river junkie and you only want to be on rivers, uh, and that's all you fish, probably don't need a drift boat and a raft. Um, but fishing out of them, fishing out of them and and rowing them. There are some differences, especially with between like a, a raft compared to kayaks, a raft compared to um drift boat. Like clearly I think we're both in agreement. Rafts get a higher fishability score um, than a kayak or canoe. Like pretty, pretty much, no question about it. Uh, much better experience standing. You can have two girls or guys fishing out of front and back. They got lean bars typically. You got spots to drop your fly line. You got fly boxes. You got room for extra rods. It's much better than netting a fish you got a quick deploy anchor system like they're designed to fish out of them and they are very good tools at that um some drawbacks i would say for sure like just the front guy i think it's actually funny i don't know how you feel about this but if we show up to the boat landing and there's three of us and we kind of do the like who's rowing who's fishing where where who's fishing out of the front a lot of the time uh the front is superior I will be the first person to be fishing out of the back of the rafts. I like fishing out of the back of the rafts. The front is, it, you know, do you lean forward into the lean bar? Do you lean backwards into the seat? Do you kind of free ball in the middle? Uh, you know, you, you there, I don't know. That's totally personal preference. I don't know what you feel like. Yeah, the, I personally like the front a lot better. Because typically you're partners, going down. <laughs> yeah, we're perfect, Dan. Typically, you're going down the river facing forward, so the guy in the front automatically gets first crack at all the juicy holes. But indeed, sometimes indeed. the fish just they want a little appetizer before the main event comes in the back. Yeah. Or you just, unless I um, pay the rower a little bit more and I make sure that he just kind of like 
tilts you away yeah. every time and angles me towards the hole. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta pay your rower well. Yeah. Yes, sir. The some other cons about fishing out of them is, and this can kind of be said for all these boats, but for some reason I think it it happens a lot in rafts. Is they tend to get cluttered really quickly, and fly line can get mm. caught all over the place. There's like straps and buckles and you know weird netting and all this weird stuff on these rafts so unless that stuff is like super clean simplified streamlined uh it can be a nightmare and like yeah uh, great point if you get, very good point yeah and and when you're looking at getting a raft i would highly recommend um talking with the manufacturer if they have some customizing options available because you don't want all this like weird cup holder stuff because that's just more things for the fly line to get caught on. So look at, you know, look at the options that are out there. Uh, some of these manufacturers have different uh, frame styles or like the NRS rafts. You can make your own frame, but you want that thing super streamlined, a lot of smooth edges on it. You don't want all this extra mumbo jumbo to get, tangled but that's a good that's a good little rabbit hole to go down because like the nrs frame it's very like you can diy a boat but all those joints and connections have areas where fly line can get caught the smith flies uh, i'm gonna pick on a couple of them right now i think the smith fly i like the frame you got the the lean bar thing that comes up and down but that little joint that the lean bar comes up and down on is an absolute nightmare for fly line I like the stealth craft frames a lot because, as you said, smooth, welded joints. Um, the rod holders, I don't think any of them have figured out rod holders yet. It's tough because where are you going to put them? But the rod, that's the one thing mm-hmm. when you started talking about things on the hooligan or things on the raft that I get stuck on. It's always those, the damn rods on the left side when you're in the front. I mean, it's easy to fix. You just cover them up. We, you see us fishing out of them. We'll have a sweatshirt or a buff or something that covers up the butt sections of the rod holders because they're always right here to the left. And if you're a right-handed caster and you're casting at the left, you're always kind of stripping line into those rods. Um, yeah, there's, that is like the trade-off with those. I, it, that's maybe why I like the back because I feel like there's less crap there in the back usually. But yeah, that, and it's, I think a good point too, when you bring up customizing Josh, like be careful with that too. Like go crazy, get the stuff you want, but also, there is always a consequence to every decision. If you want to add the cooler seat and the Yeti loadout seat and the two seats and the duck bill and the five rod holders, like you just added a ton of weight. Uh, You're going to have to row that weight around and it doesn't necessarily like help, Um, you know, especially when you want to cover water, it's going to just be this big, heavier thing to row around. Um, So just, you know, minimalistic is never a bad thing. I think. especially when we're talking about fly line getting caught and trying to cover water. Um, yes, sir. What else can we, what else? What Dan, else? I feel like we, we go ahead. Oh, some of the cons with rowing uh, a raft versus a drift boat. So when you go through a heavy rapid set, it's going to be really easy to stop that boat. But if you, if there's a really juicy hole on one of the sides and you got a hole, talking about a drift boat. Fishy, I'm talking about a ra- uh, raft right now. Yeah. yeah so you, okay. you 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 just went through a rapid set. It's going to be easy to stop that boat, but it's going to be very hard to hold that boat into position. You know, because there's there's not a lot of uh, weight to it, so that yep, water is just going to want to. You don't have chines to hold you there, so that's one of the the drawbacks. Uh, whereas like a, a heavier drift boat or just basically any drift boat, when it's going through those rapids, it's going to be a little harder to stop. But once you get that momentum going back up river, you can hold it there a lot easier than you can a raft for sure. Mm-hmm. That's a really good point. Yep. And likewise, like pushing, I think when you bring in like covering water, let's say you fish a good spot and then you got to push through some stuff. Um, or you have wind blowing against you, uh, what makes that raft really easy to stop and what makes it really light on the water is also what makes a wind SOB and it kicks your butt. Um, 
because it just it's like a big flag out on the water it gets blown um and and you know even if you have crosswinds and you're trying to hold a line like they they get a little bit they're touchy you gotta you gotta kind of constantly be adjusting and fighting the wind and i mean we've been in the boat together we're like there's just nothing the rower can do sometimes you just get a big gust and it just blows you into the bank and you're like all right hold on guys hold on we're just gonna have to hold the fuck on for a second here this is we were on land all of a sudden drift boats are a little bit better at that they're they're gonna hold the line a little bit a little bit better um be a little bit more mass to move i will say i think um I feel like I can be a little, when it's not windy, I, I really like rowing rafts though. Like it, you can just really get the spot on the spot. You can crab it, you can slow it down right in the, you know, I can just touch it a little bit where drift boats are, it'll take a little bit more, a little bit more force to turn it and move it and crab it and slow it and all that stuff. Um, they still row so well though, but I think comparing those two, I, I, I think, and, and, this goes probably for both of them. If like your raft, if you know how to row or you kind of, you're okay and your raft isn't rowing well, or your drift boat isn't rowing well, really look at the oars you have on it. Just cause you bought it used from somebody and they had a set of oars on it. Like, um, for instance, uh, like the counterbalanced, um, big wooden square top, eight foot oars on rafts. I hated, I immediately got rid of them. Um, they just too heavy uh you don't have enough room in the beam for the counterbalance to really help you out you need to make it it just they didn't work for me i might be on my own there it might be totally totally on an island but i immediately switched to something lightweight and a little bit longer went to nine foot the eight foot probably wasn't as much of an issue as the weight of those heavy oars was not a good um not a good formula with the raft. Whereas on a drift boat, they can actually kind of help you a little bit. Oh uh, man, I think we beat we beat rafts, and we're we're already an hour in. This is probably going to be a long one, but it's a fun one. We could talk about boats for like four hours at least. Um, I guess anything else on rafts, Joshua. Otherwise, we'll put that star next to it. Is like pretty high up there on the. You should consider versatility, fishable. They they do a lot of things pretty well. Yep, I'm a big fan of rafts, folks. Big fan, big raft guy over here. Big raft guy. Uh, me too. Me too. Yeah, I will sorry. not be getting rid of my raft anytime soon. Big shout out. I do like the hooligans. That's that's my favorite. Um, I I guess I do have another point I'll make on rafts. Sorry. We're all over okay. the place. We're we're just like kids Good. on Christmas talking about boats, but just comparing <laughs> the rafts. Um, because that's I think people are like I want a raft, but which one do I get? And I think you get uh the hooligans and Smith flies pretty comparable. Um, you have a, a little bit smaller option, a medium option, and a bigger option with the hooligans. I went with the hooligan because. Um, I wanted the green one instead of the gray one. No, I'm kidding. That's not why I went with Julian. Terrible answer. <laughs> terrible joke. Um, I like the frame. The frame I liked better. Um, I like the rod storage a little bit better. I like just the the setup, the configuration. Um, but both, I've been in both, both really good boats. Um, overall, awesome. Um, but I would kind of stealth craft i think wins for me even pre-sponsored by this podcast i bought a stealth craft so take that for what it's worth um fly crafts interesting not as like rowable fishable and you probably have a bit more of an opinion here but i think they win on the it's literally in the damn commercial that they have you can throw it off the bridge it's it's way more lightweight it can get into a few more spots that maybe a hooligan and smith fly cannot um, it will also get its ass kicked on bigger water where a hooligan or a smith fly might be okay. But that's kind of, I think, unless I'm missing something, the main kind of decision criteria amongst like, which one of those should I get? Yeah, you hit it on right? the head. Yep. I'm not going to beat a dead well, horse. Yeah, we're, we rafts. We like rafts. We're big raft guys. Um, drift boats, drift boats, drift boats. So, yeah, I I think drift boats, 
they overall they're very we're gonna we'll get into them extensively there's a couple different styles and types and um you know they start to bleed the line this is it it becomes more of a spectrum because you got like the big rocker drift boats the skiffs and then the power drifters and like they it kind of becomes this weird muddied gray area but standard drift boats um really good i mean if you can get your hands on a there's not a lot of them in the midwest because a lot of the manufacturers other than stealthcraft are all out west um for the most part but really good solid it's just like i don't know how else to say it but there's like a not a lot you can fuck up factor on a drift boat tougher to sink tougher to break tougher to ruin tougher to like it's just they kind of just float down the river you know and and there's a lot of room to maneuver in them and fish out of them and if you fall over you got just like they kind of have a little bit of they help you out good getting started river boat for sure did you own one josh i can't remember if you ever had a drifter drift boat i did i had a drift boat for a very brief amount of time and i went back to my raft but i will also non-biasedly talk about what i like about drift boats as well well i also want to hear why like what what drew that decision because there's obviously you, you divorced her quick yeah it was it was not a long time that i had that boat and it was What'd a have- gently used drift boat it was a high side hide an old one like an 87 or an 89 oh, so it was pretty it was pretty old school but yeah it was it was just kind of a pain in so i had a, a jet boat at the time so i just was like if i'm taking the drift boat out on these big rivers i might as well just take the jet boat out yep um the things that i really like about drift boats though is they're just they're so nice to fish out there's like rolling down the they river really in a are. Cadillac. You got a, you got a big open concept. There's usually really good rod storage, especially those ones that have the trays up above. Uh, they got the hard you bottom. Bring a lot so of if, shit. You're right. You're right. You can bring a lot of stuff. The hard bottom is great for older fishing people. Uh, if you're guiding, they're going to complain a lot less. The older clients getting in and out of the boat when you're doing that, those late season float trips, like we're talking November, December, it's much nicer to be in a drift boat than it is in an inflatable. I'll tell you that way nicer. Oh my gosh. For like several reasons. I mean, obviously one, I got my Mr. Buddy in my drift boat and I'm not fire is not a great thing in rafts in general, whether that's propane heaters or (laughs) stoves or cigars, like there's a little bit of a, you gotta be careful with that one. And you're pretty pretty fairly safe. Did you in, learn in the hard? Part. No, I did not. But I heard some stories. I won't throw him under the bus. <laughs> but I know someone whose uh, cigar burnt a hole through someone else's raft. Uh, so you got to be oh, careful no. with that. I don't know while they're on the water. Oh yeah, yeah. Dang. Got to be got to be careful with fire and inflatables for sure. Um, yeah, but you're totally right. They are. For like a true river float boat, float boat. I don't know why that term it just sounds so weird to me when people say it. But for a float boat, uh, drift boats are pretty awesome. They run skinny. There's a lot of different styles. They're comfy. They have a ton of room. Um, they're fun. I I like. I do miss having my drift boat. I had a LP 16 foot Clackercraft, and um, you could just. They're, they're still versatile too. I mean, I motored that thing up the lower Wisconsin with a long shaft four horse. It was a tugboat and it was just like, you know, with a big rocker, it was hilarious, but it like still did it. Rose well. You can put three guys or girls in a ton of gear. We actually fished with four guys out of it once down the down a river in northern Wisconsin and like it was totally fine. So it was pretty awesome and hilarious. Uh, like it wasn't like the boat was dragging bottom and it was like running lower. It was, it was just, it was good. So good all around durable, you know, can't really, like I said, can't really screw it up where like you take a raft and you run it into a rock and then you leave it out in the cold over winter. And then it's out in the sun. And like that drift boat is, or that uh, raft is 
probably shot after one season. Like you can be mean yep. to your drift boat, not recommended, but you can just be totally mean to it and just leave it out. And it's usually going to be there when you wake up. Yep. Um, like Dan was saying earlier, they hold a line really well going down the river. So if a big gust of wind comes up, you're not going to be blown all over the place. Um, you can make smaller adjustments and it's, it's going to be a lot easier to control. Um, they're going to be a little bit harder to stop in fast water, especially if you have a gigantic drift boat. But once you get that upstream momentum going, they're going to be a lot easier to hold into position. Yep. I totally agree. Totally agree. So like, honestly, the con list is not very long for me with drift boats. Um, like I'd probably, if, if we will probably bring this up multiple times, if we have that, like, man, if I could have, ideally I had unlimited garage space and budget and I could have the right boats for everything like drift boats definitely hit the list. Um, I think if you're looking at drift boats in the upper Midwest, things to consider are mainly the rocker. I think given the fact that we don't have um, a lot of heavy class three plus water that we float down and fish, um, you don't need a big rocker. You don't need like those, the Dory style from, you know, the Colorado and the snake and like the, the stuff from out West. There's a reason they use those boats because they, perform well in pretty heavy current, uh, pretty heavy rapid sets. Um, and they do really well in those. Like they're, they're pretty awesome. If you watch some of the videos online about them, or if you've been in them out West, we just don't have a lot of that water that we fish. And as Josh mentioned, like mentioned, uh, especially in low water seasons, which we're kind of going on a, a few years of. Um, so that's, that's kind of where, I think they become less ideal. But if you're looking at them, consider the the skiff styles or the the less rocker. So we're talking about like the curvature from the bow to the stern of the boat. That that curvature, uh, the more curvature, the more rocker. Um, the more they're gonna handle wavy stuff. The flatter they are, like the real flat ones are kind of the skiff style. They'll row really well, um, motor a little bit better. Um kind of the are usually lower sided, like the gunnels are usually lower and that can be a lot more uh, ideal to streamer fish out of because our rods are typically pointed. We're figure eighting, pointed at the water. Um, so I think those those probably get the nod. Ideal drift boat for the upper Midwest was, in my opinion, at least for sure, the skiff style. Um, I don't know what you think. Yep, I totally agree. I love everything about drift boats, um, but... Yeah, like you said, the last couple of years with the lower water and the fact that you need to have fairly well manicured boat launches to use them uh, kind of limits some of the floats in in our immediate region for yep. that well, type of then stuff. You can still, just for folks considering it, you can still drag those things over crap and gravel and slide it down the bank and beat them up, but they have to be trailered. Um, you have to be able to kind of back it in and use, you know, at least be able to get it off the trailer and have, you know, five feet of room to slide it down something. There's not like, you can't lift it up and drag it over a rock. Like it's, that's going to be tough. Um, it, it takes a lot of force for two gentlemen or two uh, individuals to lift a drift boat. Um, they're heavy. So that's like probably the main con that i see with them and experience with them in the midwest is like we just they're so awesome to fish out of i love them but we just don't have a lot of water that's perfect for them you end up kind of getting confined you know um our, our big rivers are super big and way more jet boat friendly which we'll start to get into in a second our small rivers are usually pretty small and gnarly and you might have to portage or drag it over uh, down tree, uh, there's not a boat landing. So it's just like, we don't have a lot of that, just like classical freestone drift boat water. We got a couple, um, and those rivers are really great for it, but even they can get low and you can run into issues. So I think that's like the main, main con. You do need a trailer. So less portable than rafts heavier, but other than that, I don't really know that I could put anything in the con department for them. Like compared to what we've talked yeah. about already. 
Yeah, they're sweet. I agree. They're sweet. And they're becoming more prevalent. They're they're definitely, I think, hard to come by in the Midwest. You know, Stealthcraft makes them, but like used drift boats are you don't see them very often on Facebook Marketplace. It's it's once in a while here and there. Starting to see a little bit more of them. But um, you know, definitely if you're looking for a used one, start start looking at Wyoming and Montana and Utah and Colorado and you'll probably see a lot more for sale out there than over here. Uh, what are we missing on drift boats, Josh? I feel like we hit that one. I'm excited to move into the next category, which is the powered boats, boats with motors. I think, I think we're ready to move into the next category. So we talked about float boats and now we're going to talk about motor boats, <laughs> motor boats. Um, and this is, we'll first touch <laughs> on like, the, <laughs> the, we'll first touch on the ones that, uh, you know, are very similar to drift boats to just kind of, you know, extend the progression here, but you have the, you know, they look like drift boats, they smell like drift boats, but they have, you know, they don't have a rocker and they have a transom kind of set up in the back with a, usually a jet on it, you know, the power drifters for lack of a better term, um, which are really sweet. I think they have a lot of, lot of, um, they, those can be a sweet tool in the upper Midwest. You know, especially when combined with something like a kayak, a canoe, or raft for some of the smaller water, and then the power drifters for the bigger stuff, where the the big rivers, you know, you all of a sudden we're starting to get into that equation of like you don't need another person to fish with, you don't need to run a shuttle, you know, you can put in and zip up and zip down and come back to the boat landing, you can run it over skinny stuff, you can put a trolling motor on it. You can put a fish finder on it. You have more storage deck space. You can still row them. So they pull a lot of the things we like about drift boats in. Um, but I think that's where kind of worth considering. If you're going to go splash for uh, a brand new drift boat, I definitely would look at, like, do I want a raft, actually? Because a lot of the water I'm going to fish is smaller. Or do I really want a power drifter? Because I'm going to spend a lot of time fishing on my own, fishing bigger water, maybe some lakes, stuff like that, where I think those are, that's where you really got to start to ask yourself those three questions, at least obviously more expensive. You put a motor on it, price goes up, but it can be, I've known, I think we've probably known a lot of folks who they get that drift boat. They're super excited about it. And now they need a friend to fish with them and to run a shuttle. And, uh, you can't just go fish on your own for two hours. It, it becomes complicated. You can, you can for sure figure it out. You can row. I've done it many times. I put the drift boat in, I row upstream, I float back down, but like you do that every day and it gets old and it gets, especially with your muskies, you're spending a lot of time. Um, so that's I th where that really starts to shine, putting a motor on it with the power drifters. Have you spent time in one, Josh? I mean, we obviously we're going to, this is where it's all going to bleed together because we got John boats with jets on them and stuff like that, which all start to fall into the same thing. But I think sticking with power drifters, what are, what are some of the unique kind of the pros that maybe I didn't talk about? Yeah, I've only briefly fished out of a power drifter and I really enjoyed it. And in fact, I almost bought a power drifter when I was looking at boats. I, the Pre things that I really like about them. Oh, yep. I really yep. like, I like the crossover aspect that they're, they lend themselves nicely to rowing. So you can be a lot more stealthy in that regard. And you're not blowing out your shoulders during the day. If you want to do so, you don't have to run the shuttle. You can still do big overnight trips, bring a lot of gear. You got the, the benefit of the hard bottom in there. Um, and you can, you can fish lakes as well. And these boats are a lot lighter than the aluminum cousins that we're about yes. to talk about as well. So yes. you can, you can get into some really tight spots and take them into some crazy skinny water as well. There's guys um, that are running them up and down some really gnarly stuff yeah. also. So they're very rugged and you can get them through most stuff. You can get a drift boat through. Yeah. And they still, you can put a trolling motor on the front and a jet on the back and yet they still row halfway decent. Um, you know, and I think kind of in this category of power drifters is the, 
excuse me, the Shawnees um, of the world. We don't see a lot of those up here just because our rivers, we, we don't, they're, they're more popular down South, but we're starting to, there's definitely a few of them up here. They kind of still fit that bill of flat bottom fiberglass or fiberglass material um, that you can row and power with a motor, a trolling motor on the front, uh, you know, jet, powered motor on the back. The other benefit is you're talking about lightweight. As we start to start talking about the aluminum John boat stealth weld cousins is you need less power to move them at the same speeds. You know, if you put, as yep. you know, a 40 horse jet on Chamu, she would barely get on, she'd barely move, but a 40 horse jet can really get a power drifter rolling just because there's less hull weight, which is, Something you're going to, like, you know, now you're getting in more trade-offs. There's always going to be trade-offs, but I think that's pretty sweet. What do you sacrifice? Um, I mean, the main thing is is durability. When you look at, I think, running a 40-horse jet power drifter made out of a composite fiberglass-esque material into a boulder, and uh, it, that becomes scary. That becomes a little different compared to banging into it with aluminum. So that's that's, like... That's, I, I don't know, a pretty good pro. There's so many pros that carry forward into power drifters that drift boats have. They just have that big extra pro of like, you can go a lot more places, a lot more efficiently without a shuttle, without a rowing partner, um, which is like really the, the main reason. Like, I love drift boats, but I hate people. Well, power drifters are good for you. <laughs> um, you know? <laughs> yeah, not. What, what about, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Not... <laughs> Not a lot of cons on the power drifter for me. I really enjoy those boats. The only thing it, it boiled down to me personally uh, is the durability aspect, like you were talking about earlier. They don't call me Bam Bam for nothing. So I wanted the peace of mind when I'm running these rocky rivers that if I, I hit something during the day or multiple times throughout the course of the year, you know, I don't have to really worry about it as much with the aluminum as I probably would drilling something head on with, with fiberglass. Cause Lord That's, knows I've been in real boat accidents, Dano. <laughs> Not this year though. <laughs> Not this year. Not You're yet. running clean. You're running clean. Yep. Um, yeah, that's for sure. Um, that's probably the main, I mean, yeah, other than the expense and motor maintenance, like that's kind of going to be, any of the boats we talk about from here on out that include motors, you're going to always have that con with them. So if you're like against that, you don't want gas, you don't want motors. Like, yeah, you're going to stay in the raft and drift boat and kayak category. Um, but I think they're nice. They're nice to have. There's a reason that I think you see a lot of them in Wisconsin and the upper Midwest. We just, we have a lot of water that fits them. I think like I would love one. I'd, I'd probably it'd be tough if you told me like you got room for two boats and you can buy a power drifter, or keep your raft. Ooh, that's a tough decision. I'm going to keep my raft right now because uh, money doesn't grow on trees over here at Muskie fool. But, uh, ooh, those are sweet. Uh, and like this, I, there's a lot of options. There's a lot of different ones, but I definitely am partial to the stealth craft ones. Um, again, I'm we're sponsored by stealth craft. We're going to plug them regardless. Uh, but I do think they make a really sweet power drifter. Lots of deck space, room. They row pretty well. They just they kind of have a good setup um, for sure on that end. Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? Should we start talking about the metal John boat cousins? Start getting into that realm because that kind of opens up. I I wanted to touch on like inboards and stuff like that, and we'll start to get into jets versus props. But that's really did we cover everything? Is was there anything left? Any stone that needs to be turned on drift boat, power drifter st type of stuff? We like. I them. don't We're really. Fans. Think, yeah, I don't think so. Cool. So next, next, next. We're kind of still in the river, riverine crossover, jet boat esque category, but we're now, I think, talking about like your John boats. Um, you know. Well, actually, I guess, hold on, hold on. Back up, back up, back up. Where do toeys fit in? Or do we just keep those in their own category? Because there they're, they're kind of the in-between here. To 
Well, Toey's actually might be kind of in this category with John Boats and, and Mod V's as a crossover boat or a hybrid True. boat of sorts. True. Not, not aluminum. So maybe let's just touch on Toey's first because I think what's unique about them, like the Toey, we could even bring in Ginus here. Ginus don't get a lot of play up here because they're, they're just, they're more, you see them more in the flats. Like you need a really small, maneuverable, motored boat that you're not going to row. Ginus definitely, you'll see a lot of more of those. They're very tippy. They're not great for running rivers. Um, they're not awesome for, you know, lakes where you get a little bit of chop. Um, but towies, they're, they're, there's a reason that they're special. They are, we're not, this is not a Bam Bam and Dan quote, but I think what, what they say over there, the utility knife, uh, they just, I mean, I've seen them without a motor row down pretty skinny rivers. Some people even argue they can row better than drift boats because they can they have a, a shorter beam. Um, they motor pretty sweet. They can take a jet. They can take a prop. Um, they're they have a lot to. They're 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 pretty good price. Like they're they're kind of crafty and tiny. I mean, we got a buddy who's got one, and he can run it on rivers, and he also can put it on the Madison chain. Um, he has a prop on his, but like, there's there's not much that we can like elaborate on. They can do a lot of things okay. That is their pro. They can do probably more things. You know, they might even run uh, lakes better than power drifters. But I think the drawback on them is the I can do a lot of things okay means I also don't do they don't do a lot of things super well. Um, I, they're tough to fish out of for a long time. There's not really like a comfortable spot in them. You know, I don't know if you've you've been in one, but they just they're, I'd rather be in a power drifter. I honestly I think a raft is even more comfortable to fish out of. Um, they can they can get old, especially when you're sitting in the back of those in the in the, the stern side of the oh man, I don't know. But very, very versatile, high versatility score. I agree with all that, Dano. And uh personally I would rather also be in a power drifter or probably a drift boat as well. But they're yeah. great boats. I fished out of them several times. I know folks around here have them. And like you said, they can get the done in a lot of different conditions as well. True. True. And it's, I think this is where you got to make the decision on your own when you're buying your boat. Like if you're just hypothetically, you're like, well, I want to row bigger rivers. I want to be able to get into weird spots. I want to be able to motor it. Sometimes I might fish some lakes. Shoot. I might even want to go down and fish the salt. If that sounds like you, I think a towie is probably climbing up your list. Um, if you're if you're flexible and you're adaptable and you want to do all sorts of, you want to take the motor off and row it without a motor, and definitely look at a towie. Um, they ain't cheap. They're but they're 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 pretty they're pretty pretty sturdy. Pretty. I haven't heard a lot of complaints on durability out of those. Um, not a ton of customizations, but you can do some stuff. You can get your Controlling motor, you can get your rowing frame, you can get jack plates, electronics, you can kind of rig them out pretty sweet. But yeah, definitely that's where you just got to ask the question of like, what am I fishing? If I am only fishing rivers in Wisconsin or the upper Midwest, you know, is that what I want? Or is a power drifter or a drift boat better? Um, or now we can talk about aluminum boats, John boats. Like, I think at the most basic level, that's what we're talking about. Um, and I think to be exhaustive, like you do, it's this, uh, it's a John boat category, uh, you know, aluminum, flat bottom, mod V you get a little bit of those, you get some that look like they're literally John boats with three kind of benches across them. They got nothing in them. They got the orlock orlock stuck into the, the gunnels. There's no like, uh, you know, sturdy orlocks. They might have like a little 10 horse on the back. Like you see a ton of these in the Midwest. They've been around longer than probably any of the boats we've talked about up here. And there's a reason for that. Super affordable, kind of really durable. Um, you can throw them away wet, you pull them out. They're ready to go. A lot of like, they do a lot. They're definitely high on the versatility. You had one old Bam Bam. 
fond memories if if i uh i've heard you talk about her fondly at least yes sir my first jet boat was a 16 foot mod v riveted hall john boat oh. and she had a really powerful 60 40 yamaha two-stroke on the back of her so that thing oh, was boy. that was insane it was insanely fast and a lot of fun to run the rivers um the thing that I, lo I loved most about that boat is I got it for a super cheap, like Dan was saying, you know, they're a dime a dozen on Facebook marketplace and you can see them on the side of the County highways and whatnot, but uh, they're super easy to mod out. So if you're handy yes. whatsoever, you know, whatever level of your handyman -ness you have, uh, you can start tricking them out. Like you can put interior LEDs on them. You can put new coating on them. You can start integrating like, wooden boxes if uh, you know if you want to start adding storage or whatever you can rip out seats you can add more seats you could put rod holders all sorts of cool stuff on those things and you probably only spent whatever three to five grand on a, a used john boat so if you put a bunch of holes in it you're not really going to be that upset about it either because they're meant to take <laughs> the abuse and there's something yes. to be said about not caring too much about your boat. You know, it's a tool Ooh, to get a job very done. Good point. Very good point. As someone with a, a brand new boat, it is a tough thing to accept because I'm used to an old boat where you went out and you didn't even notice some of the dings. And, you know, yeah, there's a lot of shit that never worked and that got frustrating. So that's like, um, like kind of a trade off amongst all of these kind of decisions is new versus old, you know? Uh, yeah, you have no idea what someone did to it. You have no idea if there is a leak in that raft or if, you know, the foam is totally waterlogged in your, your you know, V-Hull. But you're not always, you can kind of just bang it up. You can kind of have fun with it. Turn it on, bum around the river, not worry about a whole lot. You didn't, you know, mortgage your first child for the boat payment. Like, you... you you're you're flexible that way for sure. Doesn't mean you just like drive it onto dry land, but pretty good overall. And then I guess you mentioned a couple things that I want us to at least cover so people know what we're talking about. I assume most of them do, but I don't want to assume uh, everybody does. Rivets. Let's start with rivets versus welded on the John boats. Why would I want rivets? Why would I want? welded and then along those lines mod v and flat bottom what are the trade-offs and differences there that you're gonna kind of encounter well i don't really know why you would ever want rivets personally because <laughs> <laughs> i Didn't had a rivet yeah right and it was leaking a lot but we crashed it a lot as well and had to go to the body shop and get re-welded but the one pro about that is probably going to be cheaper to get a riveted yeah, hall. And yeah, they're all over the internet they're you lot, said, and the county highway. Uh, yeah. 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 You could probably get a free one from an old farmer or something like that. <laughs> so it's a great starter boat. It's a great starter boat. If you have a, a good engine and you destroy that hull, just scrap the dang thing and go get a new one. Uh, yeah. There's like, there's one, I, your next door neighbor probably has one. Yeah. Yeah. I would much rather have a welded hull. They're going to be a lot more durable. And for rivers, typically, yeah. For rivers, typically those uh, the aluminum that they're using in welded hulls is thicker than on a riveted boat. So you gain a little bit more weight, but you're going to have a lot more durability in that hull. Yes, for sure. And then like flat bottom mod V, you know, it, this is like, again, where are you fishing? What are, where are you going? Uh, because flat bottoms are really sweet. They ride really skinny, uh, you know, they, in rivers especially. Um, that Mod V helps a little bit in the bigger water with the chop and the wind. And, you know, if, if you're going to be that person who wants to fish some big rivers and some lakes, the Mod V, you know, will help you. It'll It'll definitely add... To the performance when the boat's running um on water where you're going to have the chance of more chop more wind you know rougher water flat bottom boats can be a 
literal pain in the ass like like a literally in the truest definition of that word a pain in the ass <laughs> when you're running on chop your ass will hurt uh after going fast especially if you're in the front of the boat <laughs> yep uh, uh a really cool feature you want to look out for if you're in the market for a john boat is if it has a tunnel hall for a jet or a short Ooh. raft. Yeah. Well, that's so the tunnel hall means go into, go for it. Yep. Take it away. Oh, kind of segue into jets here. Yeah. Well, like so the what the tunnel versus means... tunnel hall thing. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Okay. Yeah. So keep an eye out for that tunnel hall. So it's just a shallow channel out of the, the back end of the boat, out of the stern. And that really directs all the water either at your you know, your prop or jet foot. So you're going to get a lot more power and it's going to help track that boat a little bit better in the water as well. Yeah. And that's, I think this is like where it comes the conversation. We've talked a lot about the hulls up until this point, And now it's a good time to talk about the different, the motor trade-off that you have to make. Um, as Josh talked about, I think, so just at a 30,000 foot level, you have jet versus prop. Do you have a jet drive? It sucks in water and spits it out. Or do you have a prop, which is a blade that spins? Um, I think most people probably know that. But it's important because uh, the jet, the intake, is usually going to ride very close to the surface of the water, very close to the bottom of the hull. Like typically on a, at least a well-rigged jet, correct me if I'm wrong, if you are running a jet, the hull of your boat is going to hit something before anything on the motor, anything on the lower unit that is above the hull. Now, with a prop, typically you're going to have your that lower unit is below the hull, including the blades, and you know that piece is below the hull. So if you are running into something, you're going to usually uh, especially if it's like a couple of feet down, you're gonna the motor's gonna hit, and that's gonna be problematic. That's usually the most expensive thing on your boat and the hardest thing to fix. So that's like first thing to think about. Now, as you get so jets definitely run skinnier. If you're running in skinny waters and you see the crazy, you know, whether it's inboard jets or outboard jets, like that you can do crazy wild shit with them. You can run up class two and three rapids and and bump thing you can literally bump the boat into rocks and gravel because the jet is just sucking any water it can and it's not hitting super important the trade-off with those being when you start sucking in things other than water weeds tiny pebbles sand muck um that's where that boat loses power and can frankly get damaged pretty quickly there's a little bit of maintenance involved with that you know and you've probably experienced this having a couple of them. Um, so I'll just kind of take the the high notes and then I want you to dive in and kind of explore, uh, especially on jets, because you have more experience running jets than me. Props. Well, again, with the jets, you also, you have this power loss issue. So you'll hear people talk about, I have a 60-40. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that you're you're getting, you take a 60-horse motor, We'll just take a 60 horse Yamaha motor that has a prop on it and you convert that prop into a jet. You rip off the lower unit and put a jet on it. You lose power. The head has the same amount of power, but the conversion into the power in the lower unit, you have a loss of power. Prop is more efficient. It generates more power. So that's like, that's what that means. And that's what your trade-off is. Um, if you would take a, uh, the same exact mod V John boat with a 60 40 jet and the exact same boat with a 60 horse prop and race them at least for the first start, the whole shot, the prop is going to win every time it gets on plane faster and it goes faster because it just has more efficient power. Now, if you're running in a shallow river, the prop is probably going to crash because the jet can run in mere inches. Um, and then again, just to circle that back and just kind of elaborate on the differences, 
if you, for instance, would take a jet on a lake like the Madison chain that can have mucky muck and weeds and sand, very frequently you will have to stop your boat and trim it up and clean out the intake because it will suck in stuff that is not water that will create power loss. But for the most part, when you're going through that stuff, as long as it's not too shallow, weeds, it, a prop goes right through it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't affect it. Yeah, you might have to clean it out or pick it a little bit, but like generally speaking, it's not even something we think about. Prop will, there's a reason that they don't, you don't see a lot of jet boats on lakes uh, because they're, they're sucking in, you know, in the, in the uh, water that doesn't have current, you have a lot of that softer bottom weedy stuff that can definitely be an issue for jets. So that might sound obvious, but we get those questions. Oh, I want a jet boat. I want to take it all over in lakes and this. And well, you got to be careful. And I think you've experienced that. And there's pros and cons to both of them. Um, and then as, so I just wanted to elaborate on that. And then we can talk about, um, like where you get really close to the two where they kind of get close to each other, but they're still not the same is like the jet and the prop with a tunnel hull, just to bring it all the way back to what you were saying. You know, if you have a tunnel mm -hmm. hull prop with a jack plate at full speed, you know, fully pinned, you can raise that jack plate and that prop is pretty darn close to running in the tunnel. Not perfectly still going to be below the hull but it's pretty darn close it, it runs really shallow the issue there is it only runs really shallow at high speeds where your boats and i'll shut up here in a second your jets you can run really shallow at low speeds because your jet is not still flush or above the hull so when you have to putt you know you run at lower speeds you sacrifice speed and you sacrifice maneuverability with a jet the props are a lot better, slow moving, right? You're just putting along and you need to turn or you need to reverse. You're going to get a little bit more performance out of a prop compared to a jet. Um, but you got to be careful because you can bang those things into things, you know? And if you don't have an extra prop in the boat, that might be the end of the day. So that's my rant on jets versus props. What did I miss? What would you add? What am I wrong about? There were a lot of really good points there, Dan, that I wouldn't really elaborate on too much further. A couple cons I've noticed with the jet is if they require uh, maintenance from a, you know, a certified mechanic, those can be tough to find in your area versus Very like, tough in if you just have a, yeah. Yeah, a st standard prop is much easier to work on. Most people are a lot more familiar with that. Parts can be harder to come by. Uh, for those motors as well. So keep that in mind. If you're looking at, uh, especially a very used jet motor, um, just make sure you do your homework on that puppy as well. Uh, one thing jet boats can do and even short shafts with tunnel hulls is they can almost give you a false sense of security out there. So you start feeling like Superman, you've just run through all of this stuff and you're getting cocky and you start taking on this macho attitude towards the river and you're not respecting it, you could get it into some big trouble really quick. It's really easy to go upstream for the most part. You can see all the rapids and the riffles and how the river is flowing down at you. And if you needed to pump the brakes, you just lay off the throttle and the boat will slow down. But when you start going downstream, you're going with the current now and it's a lot harder to see that stuff where you came up originally and we're navigating the channel. So uh, you can get into some deep trouble. You know, you think you're going over something that's definitely deep enough, but uh, you plow right into it. So, and then you still got be... the trouble. You got can't, can't get back up. Like you, you go over yeah. it and you're kind of stuck. And yeah, just like boat safety yep. on the river. And you got to be, that might be a topic. Yep. Exactly. You, you got to be from experience for the most there, part Bam Bam, to be going or... through. <laughs> Super skinny stuff. You kind of said yeah, it like you had I've a, unfortunately a learned the hard way. Share. Yeah, well, that's how you learn, I guess. Yeah. 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 I I don't, I don't know if this is good advice, but uh it is okay once you get a like your first boat to to ding it up a little bit, you know, get some of the 
the newness off it. See what its capabilities are, you know, before you go full throttle across the channel, you know, like that start to get comfortable with like seeing water depths and what this boat can do, how it handles in certain current situations. If you're on a river and whatnot, and it's okay to get a couple dings and scrapes in it. I think that's just a good point too. And how to like, especially with a motorboat, it just sounds so weird in my head. I can't get over it. Motorboat. Not for those reasons either. Get your mind out of the gutter. It's just like a weird term. <laughs> um, but when you get it for the first time, like, you know, you just got your new jet. Don't just take it to the crazy river the first time. Like, you, does it start? How, how shallow does it run? Does it get on plane? Does it start the first time, but not the second time? Is there gas in it? Has it been cleaned? Like, go through those motions. Take it out on a lake you're familiar with where it's safe and you're not going to go four miles downstream in a sketchy river. You know, experiment with it. How quickly can I get it up on plane? Oh, I got another person in the boat. Does that change it? Uh, how shallow do I think I run? Like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in a foot and I can feel it hitting bottom, the hull. Well, that's like, be careful. What's the difference? What is it like going slow? Can I turn it and dock it at the boat ramp and stuff like that? Like, don't be ashamed. We all, that's literally spent like weeks doing that, breaking in my new boat. Like what, what is this new unfamiliar thing? Um, it's definitely a good precaution. I think we all, we've seen the boat fail groups on Facebook. They are one of my favorite groups on Facebook and Instagram. That definitely brings me joy in the nights and while I'm on the toilet. Um, watching people do absolutely ridiculously ludicrous dumb things with boats <laughs> it's 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 crazy how you don't really need to take a class uh to drive a boat of any horsepower um you just need to fill out some forms online and it's it's nuts but take it slow take it slow and then like bam bam said don't be afraid to especially the older ones you know ding them up a little bit as long as it's not uh something totally stupid and don't, yeah, we, we're not, we're not, we don't have any liability for you digging up your boat, but you know, use it. Not meant to sit in the garage and on the trailer for sure. Ah, uh, what else? What else? What else? I feel like we kind of, we John boated ourselves out there really good. Like, I think high versatility score, high affordability score. Probably like medium to high fish ability score. I mean, you got to rig it up to fish and make maybe put some decking in. And, you know, it's easy to go feel like you're going to go over the deck and you might have to add a trolling motor, but you, you can get it to be pretty fishable. Um, and like, like we said, on the affordability, they're available everywhere. High DIY score. Like if you're like, man, I don't like any of these boats. I don't like how a, to a towie looks. I don't like how a stealth craft looks i don't want a drift boat like make your own then go buy a john boat and do what you want um you just like driving boats into sketchy spots like also john boats are good for that they're 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 you can get another one um what else what else what else cons i mean i don't see a ton of cons it's a good starter boat is like my takeaway here yep and you can typically find them in a tiller steer. So you'll save a bunch of money there, which means you're steering from the stern of the boat with the handle yep. or a side console. Those are very popular options in yes. the John boat realm. Yes. Much nicer to find the center console, um, which we're going to go long folks. I'm looking at the clock. I'm not going to slow the conversation down or hurry, hurry old Bam Bam up until he gives me the winky face that he's got to go to bed. Um, but like just quickly, I guess kind of while we're on the topic and we don't have a lot others to cover, but like talk to me about tiller versus stick steer. What the hell's a stick steer center console, dual console. Um, you know, I think that's important now we've kind of covered the prop versus jet debate. Uh, or at least like the trade-offs, what, what, what do I need to know about consoles and steering wheels and tillers and all that good stuff? Well, let's start in the back of the boat. So if you have what's called a tiller steer, so you're, you're holding on to that handle that comes off of the engine and you're typically either seated or standing up, holding on to a safety bar, driving the boat. 
you're going to get a lot of maneuverability that way. And it's going to be a lot pretty responsive. They're super fun to drive. It takes a little bit of getting used to, to, to figure it out, but it's pretty easy. Um, and then one of the drawbacks is you can't see over the bow of the boat. Sometimes it's a little bit more difficult, especially if you got a tall person in the front and you're trying to like navigate through rapids or whatnot. So there's a trade off there. They're usually a lot more cost effective than at console to the boat as well. And they're pretty common. So one of the most common boats out there is the tiller steer. Now, uh, the next realm is probably the side console boat. Those are also going to be a very cost effective option. Um, and you can see a little bit better than the tiller steer because you're, you're going to be either like a third, sometimes even a half or two thirds of the way up the boat. So you're going to, you're going to get a little bit more visibility, slightly more expensive than the tiller steer, but yep. less expensive than a, a center console. Yeah, um, and I think as far as fishing trade off that I because I had a tiller, the, yeah, I loved it. But the thing that like got me so excited for a console was the thing that has all of the tangly, the throttle, and all that is in the middle of the boat where I don't fish. I fish. Yep. Somebody's gonna fish out of the back of the boat, and when that motor, the tiller handle, and you get a little bit more, especially you know some of the older John boats are going to have the exposed gas tank and battery and steer like it, it gets, it, it, be conscious of it. You can, you can work around it. I can, I put stuff in the way that covered all that up, but like the console is nice. Cause all of that is in the middle of the boat away from where your fly line is. Correct. Yep. And then, yeah, you get up to the center console, dual consoles. Those are going to be more expensive, but really good visibility. The center console is, is cool because if you're fishing by yourself and you're cruising, the, the weight's always in the center. So that boat's going to be really easy to drive and you can lean into turns and, and all that good stuff. It's really safe. If you were to hit something too, you're not going to go flying out of the boat for the most part. You're just going to, you know, hit your that buddies center will, console. But you won't. Yeah. Your buddies will, but you won't, you'll be nice and safe. <laughs> And then the the dual console is really nice for the big lakes or really windy situations. And I'll let Dan elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you hit it. You, I mean, that's the main, the comfy kind of protected thing. We you don't see them a lot in the river boats because it just takes up room. You know, I think if I had to, ideally, I think most of us, there are some people with the exception, but like ideally, I think a center console jet prop tunnel boat is pretty sweet for the rivers and running the big rivers because you do you can see all that stuff is out of the way the tillers in the back as opposed to you know the console's kind of in the middle and you especially like for guides you know i know you guys spend some time guiding out of your center consoles and it's like you kind of got your spot where you're not like telling the you know maybe you're in a spot where you need to get the motor fired up quick or you just you're always kind of doing that swap game with the customer um, which can be a lot like you're just in your spot. You got your screen, you got your ignition, you know, you can kind of hang there and run the boat from the middle. So that's like something to think about. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think that's like, we kind of covered it. I mean, the only thing maybe to add onto all this, so we covered motors. Well, we didn't talk about stick steer. It's a little bit of a hard to come by unique kind of like, it's not a steering wheel. It's you have like a lever, a stick literally um that you steer the boats mm -hmm. with i believe like for instance like to bring it back towies they don't make center console or console options for but i believe there's some stick steer options which just allow you to move that kind of driver's seat up away from the tiller uh, which is nice but it's still some people love them um you know not the full similar you know steering wheel uh you still have the throttle and the steering separate as opposed to tillers where that's all, you know, my hand is throttle and it's steering, which is, it's kind of nice, especially when you're doing river stuff and you need to throttle up, throttle down and steer. It's all kind of together. Whereas when you're driving a steering wheel boat, you, you really want to, for safety reasons, keep that hand on the throttle, keep that hand on the steering wheel. Um, so trade-offs, like, again, we'll, we'll kind of summarize with where some of these all fit in, but just to round out then moving on, like to round out the aluminum, river boats 
I think, you know, you look at a boat like the one you have, the Stealth Weld, and there's a few in that class, whether it's like the G3s, the Lows, where you do take like a step up. It's a nicer, it, calling it a John boat feels like doing it some disrespect because it's like, it's a, it's a fucking fishing boat. I mean, it's like, a, it's brand new, like when you got it. It's, it doesn't feel like a John boat to me. Like I don't think of Shamu as a John boat or or whatnot. Um, so there are like more rigged up, outfitted, properly designed, built up John boats, I guess you will, aluminum mod Vs that offer you more. A, a lot of that is not going to come in how the hull and the motor performs. It's very similar to John boats. You just get the nicer things like the center console. Uh, you know, the bow cap where the trolling motor fits nicely, the really nice casting deck seats and, you know, typically those older John boats, like all the the gas can and the batteries are all exposed and yours is all obviously like under the deck. Um, so it, you, there are really, those are awesome. I think there's a reason I love fishing out of Shamu. It's just, which is, by the way, if you don't know, we that's Josh's boat's name is Shamu, the big the big stealth weld. If you're if you're here for the first time, we're not talking about a killer whale. We're talking about a boat. Um, <laughs> um, it just it's it's sweet. It's kind of it's got the like rugged river take it kind of lots of spots performance of the John boat, but it also feels like I'm kind of in a nice comfy fishing boat, and it's like d- it does not suck to be in in late November. I'll tell you that. No, not at all. It's a straight up river assault vessel. Big yeah. time. Um oh, yeah. and it's meant it's meant for serious water and to keep everybody safe and keep you in the game, you know, during those late season trips and whatnot. But yeah, for the, the bang for the, the buck, stealth craft just it outshined everybody on the market. Yep. And uh sometimes even like availability, like you can design it. You know, the G3s mm-hmm. and the Lows, a lot of those come pretty sweet, awesome boats, but like usually prefab. Doesn't mean you can't change it after market, but they're kind of pre-done in certain configurations. Um, cool. Well, uh, we're going to end it there because we talked about all the river boats in the world and fly fishermen don't fish on lakes, so we don't need to talk about lake boats, right? Wrong. Wrong. A bad joke. I'm working on my dad jokes. Lake, but... Working on my dad jokes, people. They're they're pretty terrible, I've been told, but I, I think that's the point. But yeah, let's <laughs> talk about lake boats, dude. Um we went in this order intentionally because like the last category that like John boat, especially mod V with a prop, like you, you have a boat that like lake boat, it, it can go on those. I think that's where that versatility index wins because they can these you see them on lakes all the time. It's probably like a lot of the guys that and gals that buy John boats, they're not like thinking of them as river boats, but they have that dual purpose, especially based on how you configure it. But for the most part, lake boats, we've like exhausted for two hours, all the types of river crafts in the world. Hopefully you guys found it useful and um, you didn't just tune out after kayaks, but perhaps maybe um, <laughs> lake boats. We're talking like usually the differences here, the main differences. Yes, they have bigger motors. Yes, they have windshields and, and can't f- fancy seats and carpets, at least some of them. But the main difference is in the hull. Uh, and you're going to get, instead of the flat bottoms and the mod Vs, which are m- helpful in running shallower water, you're going to get deeper Vs. You know, you got you got the kind of more popular now, the deep V. You have the tri-hull. Those aren't really that popular anymore. Um but, you know, and that design is meant to break water and chop and run a, a boat more stability and more comfort over choppy water. Um, you know, when it's a lake is flat calm and there's nothing there, you don't really notice a whole big difference between a boat like Josh's a Mod V and a Deep V. But as soon as it starts to get a little windy, which as we all know, it always seems to do on lakes even a couple miles per hour or even the waves from another boat. That's when that deep V helps break that up. And that's why as you start to get into bigger water on lakes, um, especially bigger, deeper water, you know, you get into a big lake, but it's all super shallow and muddy, like deep Vs 
might not be great because they they draft a little bit lower in the water but that draft and that deep v helps it make for a smoother ride so when you're fishing you know lakes like the madison chain or the chippewa flow edge or you start to get up into the bigger stuff the great lakes the shield lakes in canada you're going to run into some pretty gnarly water um and you probably want to be out fishing it maybe you're fishing in the calm bay but you got to get home to the boat landing or the the dock and you got to cross a lot of water so that's where um the deep v's come in the second piece usually this isn't always the case is then the bigger motors um and that's a little bit based on the type of boat you're getting you can obviously there are guys and gals that put 200 horsepower motors on jet boats and run them in the river and it's absolutely ridiculous and insane and they're they're like it looks like so much fun and i want to do that um and then there are 20 horse deep v lake boats so it you know, that's come and comes into speed, but typically you get into the big 18, 21, 22 foot deep V fiberglass boats. And yeah, they have a huge motor on them and they can go fast. And because they have the hull plus the motor, they can go fast and be pretty comfortable. They can break up chop. So that's like, okay, we've entered the new category, high level shit. Um, there's really not much to like talk about on that. T- I mean, it's literally like, this is where you have to ask yourself what type of water. I think somebody reached out and to, to me, when we posted the, um, the video, the, the, the walkthrough of the new lake boat I got, and they were asking genuinely about like, whoa, do you row it? Is why don't you have a jet? Uh, what is that for rivers? And like the answer was frankly, absolutely not. I bought that boat with almost zero intention of putting it on a river. It was because I had a drift boat. I had a smaller, uh, aluminum boat that were more crossover. But every time I go out onto the big lakes, I get my ass kicked, you know, a little bit of chop, um, and, a big body of water and it just was not, it wasn't even safe. Sometimes Uh, there's some hilarious moments on the Madison chain where it just rollers, you know, coming up over the gun. Like it's just not good. Um, So like you got to make that decision of like, what do you want to fish? I personally wanted to fish the lakes local to me, the lakes throughout Northern Wisconsin. Uh, There's not a lot of fly fishing pressure on them. There's big muskies. Um, many of you know, I'm having a very big life change in a couple months where maybe I don't get to fish for 10 hours on a float and kind of just disappear down into the river, which I do love. I only might have two hours before work before the shop opens or two hours at night. And I want to be able to get out, get on the boat and get fishing and come back pretty quickly. So for those reasons, personally, Lake Boat was always what I wanted. Does not, it can run, you know, it can go below dams where like, some of the walleye boats go, but not designed for moving water. So that was like the, the big why. And I think what people should ask themselves, do I want a crossover boat or do they want to go like a direction like I went, which is I got a Lund impact lake boat and a hooligan raft, you know? Yeah. I'm not going to be able to fish the same rivers as well or some of them at all. Like Josh can, because he's got the stealth weld Shamu. Um, it's not called that at Stealthcraft. They're, people are going to call them and be like, I want the Shamu. <laughs> well, what the hell is that? <laughs> we don't make that boat. Uh, the Stealth Weld is what it's called. Um, but I can still fish a lot of awesome rivers in my hooligan. And then I have a special boat for lakes. And I think that's like that question we posed it earlier, which is like, when you're, the where is so important when you're deciding about where, 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 where do you fish? Where do you want to fish? Um, that's what drove me to go that direction. And it's what drove you, I assume, to go the direction you went. You live in a river town. I live in a lake town. Um, and I think that is probably indicative of why we have the boats we have. So it, it might be, I'm kind of beating that one dead, but I think as we like kind of did a major category shift worth it for people, because I think there's a lot of like, they they just look at your boat and like, ah, oh, it's a big boat. It's for the lakes. And it's like, not really. I've been in Josh's boat on the lakes. It works, but not, not, not as good. It's not really designed for that. No, not at all. So Meanwhile, yeah, to, I would uh... ruin my boat if I took it in the spots you took your boat. <laughs> 
Exactly. Yeah. So the moral of the story here, folks, is <laughs> go back to those those three questions we originally asked is where are you going to fish? Who are you going to fish with? And what species are you after? And then you yep. just make pros and cons lists until, you know, a couple boat options kind of reveal themselves. Yep. And kind of accept the sacrifices. You're going to always, there are moments I wish I had a boat that ran skinnier. There are moments that we can't, we can't always have it all. In fact, most of the time we can't, but um, you're going to make some sacrifices along the way. But just to round out lake boats, and then we'll kind of we'll kind of bring this to a, a slow uh, close. But the big decision on lake boats is going to be size and material type. So you kind of have you know fourteen to sixteen feet is like smaller lake boats, you know smaller ponds, smaller lakes, calmer days. It's not going to do very well in rough water. It's not going to hold its line because it's a lighter boat. So when the wind starts roaring you're out on the water and the trolling it's going to have a tough the wind's going to blow it more um you know you're going to get rocked around in some waves even when you're going at full speed it can't go as fast it doesn't have as nice of room and storage and big decks uh, and then you kind of get into that like middle to the larger you know more of what i have 17 18 foot maybe even 19 foot boats you know now you start to get really stable typically for fishing boats, at least, typically, those are aluminum. There are some fiberglass 17, 18, and 19-foot boats, of course. Um, but you still, the reason there, you still have a good power-to-weight ratio with aluminum when it's in that 16, 17, 18-foot. Still heavy enough um, to do the things you want in terms of holding your spot, having good track when you're running at full speed, um, you know, durable, and it, the, the power that you can put on it, it can still make that boat go pretty fast, you know, 20, 30, 40, getting into 50 miles an hour. Um, as you get bigger, you're really just, you're genuinely getting a more stable ride and more room for activities, more rod storage, longer rod storage, more deck space, uh, you know, all that disco stuff. ball. So, disco ball you got a little i don't i didn't get the disco ball model i'm gonna have to wait for that one next year but um yeah more room more stability so again you got to ask yourself what you want for fly fishermen and women you really can't fish with more than two people at once so if you know you're fishing small water it's not like you're going to get a 22 foot boat and be like oh, i can get four people to fish at once that's not going to happen it really comes back to the type of water you're gonna the wear you know, if you are, uh, if you look at, uh, you know, Eric, uh, musky Eric uh, out on Lake St. Clair, who's uh, fly fishing for muskies for a long time out there, he's got a big boat because that's a huge body of water. And he's got to go super fast, cover a lot of water, you know, drive from Canada to the United States and back and forth and back and forth all day long. Um, it's he, he needs to go fast he needs to be efficient and then he needs a big comfy ride because he's got customers and you've been out on big bodies of water with 10 miles an hour wind it can get pretty gnarly and that big big boat helps with that so size is really just as you go up the size realm yeah you get more space but it's really the type of ride you want um you know you'll see these like why do these tournament anglers have these enormous bass boats or or uh, fiberglass boats with huge motors on them. Well, it's because when they need to, you know, be on five miles away from the takeout 15 minutes before fishing ends, they can confidently go to full throttle and get back home safely uh, in no time. Like that's what you hear a lot of them talk about. They're covering a lot of water. Um, so those, those are some points to consider. As you look at like maybe bass boats versus some of the more kind of traditional, I'll call them like walleye boats, you typically see like the higher, higher sides, um, a little bit more stable ride on some of that like walleye model. Mine kind of falls into that bucket, like a little bit higher, sits higher in the water, um, you know, kind of protects you a little bit from that stuff. You see those bass boats and they're really low to the water. They got the big deck that kind of looks like an infinity pool. Now they're going to be a lot faster. And are frankly, pretty nice for fly fishing. You got a lot of open deck space, um, but don't perform as well in the choppy stuff. So trade off there. And then lastly, I, I, you know, I don't think 
we could talk about this whole category for another hour, but I think in terms of our audience and the folks listening and ourselves, like there's not a lot of people deciding between a fiberglass and an aluminum boat. I think most of the the questions we get are around the drift boats and the jets versus props and John boats. So that's why we, we elaborated quite a bit there, but just to round this out, fiberglass versus aluminum, um, you got different schools of thought. You got kind of the only aluminum crowd, the only fiberglass crowd. You got people that have played with both. Um, you're going to get a little bit smoother ride out of fiberglass. You're going to get, um, you know, a little bit more durability out of aluminum is to boil it down into a couple salient points. If you are going to be, you know, bumping into rocks on the lakes and you're a little bit of a, you're all over the place, like aluminum might be for you. You can damage a fiberglass boat pretty quickly. If you're out on a huge body of water uh, and you're not going to be bumping into stuff, you're usually pretty deep and you need that stable ride. Fiberglass um, is, is definitely something to consider. Fiberglass usually gets a little bit more expensive. Um, but yeah, I, I really, I don't, we could probably, if folks reach out to us, we can definitely get into this stuff. This is like a whole category in and of itself because there's so many models, crest liners and LUNs and, uh, you know, asking us about the toughies thing and bass boats like it's a it opens up a whole nother pandora's box but i think the main purpose here was to just kind of compare lake boats and river boats because that's where i get the most questions um like well can i take this on the lake and can i use this on the river and i think we we spent enough time on that which is good anything like you think i missed or should touch on there josh otherwise maybe i'd like to maybe look at a few of those questions and like round it out. We're going to put people to sleep here soon, perhaps. I think cool. we're all good. We, we really uh, did a thorough job there, Dano. Let's get into we those tried. questions. We tried our darndest. Um, yeah. So we'll get into some questions, but like the theme, the main points here are where do you want to fish? What do I want to target? And who do I mostly want to fish with? How many people? Um, there is no one perfect boat. We probably sound like a broken record. There are a lot of different options. Versatility. If we had to probably pick the most versatile boats, mm, it's probably going to be in that raft and John boat. Like Those are the ones that you can do the most things with. They kind of hit on all the affordable, fishable, you know, durable scores. So, you know, if you're looking for a first boat, you fly fish, you're probably fishing rivers. You know, I think river, river environments, at least consider maybe a raft and jet boat or John boat with a jet. Those are, those are definitely, um, good options. They're going to get you into a lot of cool places, a lot of good experiences. Questions, the questions that we got, I guess let's move into that. Um, I guess we'll start with a fun one. Bananas in the boat. What is your ex experience with that? Is that bad luck or just an excuse for not catching fish? Mr. Bam Bam, bananas allowed in your boat? I per I've personally never seen it to be bad luck, but muskies are hard enough to catch as it is, and that's usually what we're targeting. So you might as well leave those things in the car. Or just finish it before you meet up for the morning yeah like it doesn't i don't even need it creeping into your your psyche at all you just it shouldn't show up with a bunch of ba uh, bananas see it's just i yeah i know but it's like maybe muskies are stupid enough where they like bananas like but uh, i don't know we're not probably we're the best doing it wrong. people to ask maybe we're doing maybe we need a whole bunch of fucking bananas in the boat they're they're like basically freshwater monkeys put a put a treble hook I'm, through a banana I'm, and throw it on my fly rod i'm trying it this weekend all right, bananas it is. I'll bring them to the PMPT. <laughs> I don't know. Gabe might not allow that. Um, yeah, right. Uh, we got a couple questions of like, what should I consider when looking for my first boat? I truly, truly, genuinely hope we answered those thoroughly. That was like the whole purpose of this topic for us. We love talking about boats. Um, just a kind of a plug. Like if you have questions, if you, you know, this boat versus that boat, reach out to us. Bam Bam and I. Um, by no means the most experienced here, but we've we've made mistakes. We've had a lot of different boats. We have things that we can help you understand and at least give you some food for thought. So do not hesitate to reach out. Um, 
we would we love talking about it clearly it's our longest episode yet um good kayaks for fishing creeks on a budget we briefly touched on that uh definitely sit on top i would check out new canoe i would check out the old town uh they have a fishing model jackson's are getting up there in price but new canoes are i think for under or right around a thousand bucks you're going to get a genuinely good fishing kayak. I've spent some time in them. Even my uncoordinated tall ass was able to stand up in there. So that's saying a lot. And they have a bunch of cool accessories. Did I miss any any, any brands on the fishing kayaks that jump out to you? I don't think so. But overall, if you're on... If you're on a tight budget for any kind of boat, whether it's a kayak or whatever, the most important thing is it just needs to be something that's dry and gets on the water. And you can always add on from there. So just start with whatever you're comfortable with and then, you know, save up for that trolling motor, or that extra whatever yeah, in the future. Agreed. And I was like the new canoe. That's why I like that one is it's not one of those trolling motor and like, you know, foot drive like it's it's paddle but it's pretty stable for fishing out of they actually like it's a lot of fly fishermen especially down south are using them so go check those out new canoe n-u-c-a-n-o-e uh why are boats always breaking oh man that's like that's another topic in and of itself but yeah if you haven't owned a boat i don't know the answer to this i think it's just the nature of putting a mechanical device in water um it's just inevitable. I mean, and you can complain about your boat's shitty and not well made. I don't know of any boat on planet Earth that doesn't have issues. It's just bound to happen. Accept it. B O A T, you know, bust out another thousand. It's just the kind of, you just have to accept it. There are ways to avoid it, right? You're the type of person that just never cleans your boat, never changes your oil never cleans out your raft, never puts 303 protectant on it, leaves your drift boat out in winter to get ice in the hull. Yeah, you're going to run into more issues than if you wouldn't do those things and take care of it. But, you know, like boat seats, God, boat seats are breaking all the time. You know, you just, it's bound to happen. Um, Accept it. Be careful. There are ways, you know, I think we're going to hopefully, we have some topics around boat maintenance and taking care of boats that we'll touch in a different episode. But I don't know, Bam Bam, you got any sage advice on how to not just lose all of your retirement money to boat maintenance and boat fixes? Yeah, it's tough, man. Uh, you're taking these things on logging roads or on a really long road oh, trip across trailers, country. Yeah. In and out of boat launches, they're bouncing around. They go through temperature changes. Something's bound to happen. Trailer so, lights, the worst. Just... Be prepared, you know. It's kind of like buying a house. Your first starter home, if it's it's a hundred years old, yeah, you're gonna have to put a lot of sweat equity into it, but you got a good deal on it. Whereas if you blow your your limit on your budget right out of the gates, you're gonna get a great house. It's gonna be a lot less maintenance, but now you're gonna be stressed about ruining it constantly. And yes. It, it could bankrupt you if you lose your job or something stupid like that. Yep. No doubt. No doubt. Um, yeah, I think that be prepared both like preventative maintenance. You know, if you don't grease your bearings and you just hope that your bearings aren't going to blow, like that's not a great strategy. Um, but also accept the <laughs> fact that they are, are bound to go and like you should have a grease gun and you should, you know, clean out your boat and check it. I think we're always kind of checking it for like, it, what's, what's going to go next. Um, just cause that's really the worst. Yep. Like I actually don't mind the things that haven't, I think I've accepted the fixes and the maintenance. It's the stuff that breaks. Like when you got your free five hours to go fishing and it's like, Oh man, now, now my bearings blew or, Oh man, now, you know, my battery's dead. Cause I left it out all winter. Um, that's the one that really grinds you because you're, you got your time to fish and now you're dealing with boat stuff. And I think that is like, that's the worst. Rather take care of it in the off season or beforehand than have to worry about it when you're out on the water. 
Okay, what else? Is it possible to take out a boat without anything breaking? That was a good question. No, it's really, it doesn't seem to be, as we just mentioned. Um, but we got two more, and they're kind of related. And it's like, do trolling motors on low spook muskies? And thoughts on how the trolling motor affects figure eights? I have thoughts on this for sure. What about you, Josh? Yeah. Well, I personally have never seen a muskie that was in the figure eight get pissed off because of the trolling motor and leave. They probably just got pissed off for whatever reason or just your shitty figure eight. That thing. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. But obviously, don't get your rod or your line anywhere near that trolling motor. Yes. That's really going to yes. affect your figure eight. Yes. I don't I don't know. Yeah. I've run I've, I've run seen muskies it, man. over with I've... the jet, jet upstream and we've still ended up boating them, so. Yeah, I I think that's a good point. Like they're muskies, so they'll occupy both ends of the scenario, but I've seen it on low and clear rivers and on lakes where like that trolling motor they don't want to come close to. And then you've heard stories of them like literally attacking the trolling motor. Um, mm. So I don't think in general, like I don't go out and like immediately think it's the trolling motor. That's the reason they're spooking. Like it's probably, it's way more likely like the boat moved. Something was, a noise was made in the boat. Um, my rod tip or rod hit the side of the boat or something along, or this like they're just kind of finicky like or i just like brought the fly up in the water column in my figure eight and gave them a chance to look up at me like all of those i think are way more likely that being said there are times where man like several fish are spooking and we're doing everything right that like maybe we should just wind drift over that spot and not run the trolling motor like it's it but just work through it a little bit i wouldn't like start with like i'm not having a trolling motor they spook muskies i think that's false like clearly false there's too many trolling motors out there catching muskies two i think um i've seen it once with and heard from others on the change in trolling motor speed like the constant steady less spooked by but the like you know, I'm futzing with the trolling motor while Josh gets a fish into the figure eight and I just crank that trolling motor up to eight right away. And it's like, whoa, whoa, that was that was not a good idea. Um, that change from like a two to an eight. And definitely I've seen it spook other fish, right? You, you can do that just over a bunch of bluegills and they're going to freak out. So steady is much better than change. Um, yeah, and I, I I don't know. I don't know that there's anything else to add for me. Like, you kind of covered it on how the trolling motor affects figure eights. Like, yeah, don't figure eight into the trolling motor. Um, if I'm in the front of the boat figure eighting, I'm more likely to bring my turn away from the trolling motor than into it. You know, like, kind of it depends where you're fishing. But, like, yeah, I don't want that trolling motor right next to me when I'm figure eighting. I, I want to maybe be a little bit farther farther down the boat. Um, you know, so that that would be my only advice there. I, I don't know that I would uh, have anything to add. It's also like probably seen more stuff go wrong with a trolling motor once the fish is hooked than when it's like coming into the eight. Like yes, like yeah. especially if you're trying to go around the bow and the trolling motor or the fish kind of crosses you and you have slack and it swims into the troll. Like that's where more stuff goes seems to go wrong than. Uh, just like figure eights into the trolling motor. But who knows? Maybe I'll put my rod tip into my trolling motor this weekend now that I said it. I've seen a lot more muskies spook off when someone gets one into the figure eight and they start screaming and then there's all this commotion in the boat. Yes. Yeah. Or like that. Yeah, like that, like, like people uh, are that step stomping forward, around. Like, oh, there's one. Yeah. Oh, there's one. And you like yep. literally tilt the boat and create a wake. Yeah, that's bad. Bad. No good. Yep. That's a good point. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll talk about figure eights next. Do some videos on figure eights. I know we've been talking about that for a little bit. But that's really, I think, uh, 
man, we covered that a lot. We're coming in at like about two hours. I really hope you found this useful. We did this one both because Josh and I are excited. We like talking about boats. We there's if we could pick our ideal boat setup, it would not be one boat. It would be several different boats, raft, maybe a jet boat, big lake boat. Oh, ideally, I mean, you you've been sending me those videos of those little mini jet boats. That looks like crazy. Not really a fishing boat, but they're like jet skis for the river, and that looks kind of fun for at least uh, an afternoon. <laughs> But that's why we did it. And we've just been getting a lot of questions about it. Uh, a lot of good questions about it. So we wanted to kind of lay it all out there and uh, spot burn it, if you will. Um, hopefully we'll have more to talk about with boats in the future. Goes without saying, but big shout out to our sponsor, Stealthcraft Boats. They make a lot of good boats that we talked about. There's a reason we reached out to them to sponsor this podcast. There's a reason I have a Stealthcraft. There's a reason Josh has too. Um, the end product of those boats, um, they're, they're just, they do a lot of stuff, you know, there are sure naysayers that prefer this one over that one, but at the end of the day, they just do those boats, do a lot of stuff well for what we're trying to accomplish. So that's really all we got folks. We really appreciate you tuning in. Please keep sending the feedback, sending the questions, uh, subscribing, commenting, downloading, make sure you don't miss one. Um, we're having fun with it and we hope you're liking it. That's it. Closing out for episode eight. Thank you for listening to the Spot Burn Podcast. Coming to you from the dungeon, this podcast is presented by Musky Fool Fly Fishing Co. We want to thank our awesome sponsors, Cortland Line Company and Stealth Craft Boats. We also want to thank all of you, our listeners, for tuning in subscribing, sharing, and spreading the good word. If you haven't heard, go check us out at muskyfool.com. Have fun out there on the water, y'all.